Ron, let's start with this. We've been talking about Greg Holland, the closer for the Rockies, getting hurt, cutting himself with a knife in the kitchen. The oddest baseball injury anyone on your team ever experienced was what? Oh, uh, on my team, geez. I, I mean, I've heard all the stories. You've probably heard all the stories, too, from John Smoltz, uh, which is not true, he told me, uh, ironing his shirt uh, while he was wearing it. Uh, to wait for <laughs> pulling his uh, back out, putting his cowboy boots on. Right. So I've heard all the stories. I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever played with a player um, who uh, who had you know missed a couple of games. I, I've I've had players that have overdone it the night before and didn't like show up for a day. But I didn't. I never had like a. The, uh, oh no! Of course, I, I remember now. Bobby Ojeda missed the playoffs in 1988, I believe. Uh, because of a gardening accident, um, uh, uh, apparently he was uh, trimming his hedges and uh, and had a gardening accident and missed the postseason. So that's about as bad as it gets. As a lifelong Mets fan, when Ron Darling joins you and he says, "I've had guys overdo it," that's the most obvious statement ever, right? When you, I mean, consider with your team back in the day, that's. I mean, is there a such thing as overdoing it with your '86 Mets? Isn't that just doing it? Listen, I, I'm a dark person, so I was even blushing as I was saying that. So, uh, yeah, no, there's, 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 yeah, there's no such thing as, as, as overdoing it with that club. The, the, the one thing that separated that club from any other team that I ever played on is that once, you know, the bell rang at 7, 7.30, whatever time the game started, uh, they not only wanted to beat you, they wanted to rip your heart out. And I never, ever played on a team like that. I played on... An unbelievable competitive teams, but that team was uh, was uh, uh, angry uh, and uh, and uh, different than other teams I played on. You know, one of my favorite things about uh, things about that team that probably a lot of the younger fans don't know about, and it would be like a whole controversial social media thing if it happened today. The '86 Mets used to do this thing, the hot foot, right? Like that, where you would light guys' feet on fire during games, right? Explain to, to people what that was. Yeah. Well, it was Roger McDowell who who really perfected it. He was in our uh, bullpen in 86. He won 14 games and saved 22. That's pretty good, right? So in between the 14 wins and 22 saves, what he used to do is take matches and gum and all kind of other stuff, roll it all up together, stick it to the back of someone's shoe, and then light it on fire. Um, And literally, you know, the thing about it, it was the reaction because everyone thinks, well, what's a hot flood? Why, Why would it matter? But people who have had one says it really feels like your foot's burning up. And, um, um, you know, luckily it's, it's not really hurting you. But uh, he was a master of it and did it all the time. And for whatever reason, you know, certain things happen over and over and you just can't stop laughing. That was one of them. And the players would never know because they would, like, climb underneath the dugout. Like, they would be underneath the dugout ben- or underneath the benches and they would literally light it on fire. It was, it was amazing watching this. There's a great video that I have, I've watched about a thousand times, 1986, A Year to Remember, which is the greatest, like, year in review <laughs> show for the Mets. And it, they, they literally focus on that because it was so funny. All right, let's get into a couple of modern-day baseball things here. Um, what, is this okay, week, yeah. what, what is this week like for players? Trade deadline? What, what goes on in that clubhouse, in that locker room, as you lead up to July 31st? How nervous are guys in that locker room? Well, I don't know. I don't know if nervous is, is the word because, you know, they're professionals. So I don't say nervous is the word, but I think that everyone around them is on uh, uh, tender hooks because, you know, your family is going to be uprooted, uh, everyone that you know. So everyone else around you is, is kind of uh, very nervous. As far as you're, you're concerned, I think what you have to do is whether you're going to be traded or not is that um, you've got to see value in, in how well you do. So you can't let – you know, the circumstance of maybe being traded to overwhelm how you play every single day. Because if you're still going to remain with the same team you're with, you want to perform at a high level. And if a team wants to acquire you, you want to perform at a high level. So um, it's not that hard. I think the difference is in the clubhouses is when management goes and acquires some real key players, the guys in the clubhouse for a week at least, are so excited and pumped up, like, boy, you know, they believe in us. We're going to go out and get this thing. And and the same thing applies for the pessimism on a team that thinks they're close and the front office does nothing. I think that's the team that, you know, will also for a week go, boy, nice uh, front office job. Couldn't even go get us a relief pitcher or whatever we needed. So, um, you know, that's that's really where it lies. 
Dallas Keuchel, Astro starter, calls out his team. Would you feel worse if you were Jeff Lunau, the general manager, not making the moves, or Francisco Liriano, who was actually acquired by the Astros and actually brought in there? Yeah, I, I would feel worse if I was Dallas Keuchel who hasn't been able to make all the starts calling uh, the front office out. Um, Interesting. You know, uh, that's hard to do when you're not out there every fifth day uh, doing it because of, of your own own injury. I, I I always felt this way about the front office, and maybe it was different in my day because you, um, you really, um, I wouldn't say respected, because these guys respect the front office. They do. But I think they feel, because of the money made, they feel a little more worthy that their you know, opinion means more, uh, as opposed to when I played, um, you really felt like the front office uh, uh, considered you part of, like a widget, you know, part of the big, the big plan. So you never really voiced your opinion about those kind of things. I, I applaud players that do it. I'm just, uh, I think that it's so hard to just play baseball um, that that dealing with being a GM too is uh, above and beyond, in, in my estimation. I think anyone should have their own opinion. I think that's great. I, I would hold mine. Talk with Ron Darling, TBS, SNY. They have on TBS the matchup on Sunday, Nats and Cubs, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Fill in this blank for me. Blank is the most impressive part of the L.A. Dodgers. Boy, um, it's an impressive part of the L.A. Because, I mean, there's so many impressive parts. Um, I, I think um, I think the, um, the freedom with which they play the game is the most underrated part. They've got talent, and, and, and we all know that. And we know that uh, Cody Bellinger is having a, an unbelievable – uh, first 90 games in the big leagues. But um, Dave Roberts, you know, as a second-year manager, and he was great in his first year, um, ha- has been perfect with today's athlete, allowing them the freedom to just play their game in the style that they play it. You know, a lot of old-school guys that are my age uh, are not into the new kind of school. And, I, you know, I'm not one of those. I, I think that um, the only way to get the best out of your athlete is to really let them be themselves. And I think Dave Roberts does that better not better but he does it as well as any other manager in baseball and i think that's why the talent is flowing in los angeles because everyone's freed up ron better addition sunny gray for the yankees or you darvish for the dodgers well it's a real tough question because uh, you darvish uh, being traded to the dodgers uh, not pitching that well going in uh, i'm going to say though you asked me the question i'm going to go you you darvish and, and the only reason i'm saying this is that i think you darvish with a really great ball club is going to find his pace. I also think, you know, there's a large, uh, a large uh, community uh, there in Los Angeles that's going to make him feel at home. Um, and I think Sonny Gray, the only thing that uh, always uh, I'm afraid of with Sonny Gray is never his performance because he's one of the gut, gutsiest pitchers in baseball. It's his health. And uh, that's the thing that always uh, scares me. Now, listen, Darvish has been hurt, too. Um, but uh, I, I, you asked me the question, I think Darvish will do better because I think the Dodgers are a better team. If I told you right now one of these two teams would be in the World Series, which one would you say is more likely, the Yankees or the Red Sox? Uh, I'm going to say the Red Sox. And, and the reason I say that is I, I think that, you know, the, the pitching, uh, the bullpen now, the addition of Reed to go with Kimbrell and others, um, I think that their best young players have not even played uh, to their best, even though Mookie Betts has been amazing and Ben Attendee's having a real good year. But you know, Bogarts is not having as good a year as he did last year. And I, I think they're going to uh, – Jackie Bradley Jr. to me is not having as good a year. So I think those guys are going to find it because they're too good not to find it. And, um, and I think what's going to happen to the Yankees, and even though they've added some really uh, solid pitching – is that they've got a lot of young players that are going to be playing six months of baseball as opposed to five months, and that September is going to feel like the baton death march for them. And, and, and that's why I think the, the Red Sox have a better chance. Interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. We think about that a lot with other sports, but that's such a good point because, I mean, so many of these guys, the Yankees, were in the minors the last however many years, and this is their first full big league season. And, and then not, not only first big league season, but under the extreme spotlight every single day that that's something that you can't teach that's something that you can't even uh, have a veteran player tell you about you have to go through it uh, yourself
Ron, let's finish with this. So much buzz this week, and I, I don't see a comp. Maybe you do. I saw a lot of baseball writers talking about the Warriors of the NBA. You know, Dave, Dom- I mean, the uh, baseball. Dave Dombrowski's joking with Cashman. Cashman's joked with Dombrowski. Is there a team that you would say is the Golden State Warriors of Major League Baseball? Well, um, I mean, if you're picking it during the regular season, you'd have to say the, the Dodgers. You know, they're 40, but two or 43 games over uh, 500. That's an amazing record at, at this at this t- junction. You know, I played on a team that won 108 games, so I kind of know what it's like to be on a team like that. Um, but um, I, yeah, I guess I mean, I, yeah, I have to go with the Dodgers right now. They're the team that's really the Golden State Warriors, even though it's the uh, regular season. But the, you know, anything can happen in the postseason of baseball. Since the second wild card, it is an extreme grind uh, for these players. So uh, anyone who's hot, and we saw this with the Mets uh, a couple of seasons ago when they went through not only the Dodgers, uh, who people could argue was a better team, but they also went through the Cubs in four games, and a lot of people picked the 2015 Cubs to go all the way. So um, th- that's the thing about baseball. Whoever's playing hottest has the best chance. Ron, great job. Thank you so much. We'll watch you Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern on TBS with the Nationals and the Cubs. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. The Dan Patrick Show, weekday mornings on Audience.